I want to introduce Jennifer Basie Sander, who's going to be my friend today in conversation. <laughs> For those of you who are not familiar with Morning Coffee, we started it just last month. We're gonna be doing it every month around the first Wednesday. And the idea is that most of us spend a lot of time, I'm assuming, Jennifer, you spent some time in coffee houses, right? Oh my, yes. <laughs> Did you have a favorite, by the way? Um, here in town or just yeah. like out in the world? Out in the world. Out in the world, there's a, there's a lovely little place in Paris called La Palette where Jim Morrison worked on the, on the lyrics Ooh. to some Ooh, of his songs. I love it. <laughs> so that's a lovely place to Great. sit and drink coffee. <laughs> and my favorite was New Helvetia Roasters and oh, Bakers, sure. mm -hmm. where Mulvaney's is currently. And what I loved about that place is it was the first place that served not only coffee, but pastries and savories. And you would be able to catch up on all of the news. You could sit there and Phil Eisenberg, the mayor, somebody from the legislature would be there. Uh, and it was really a, a way of building community. And that's what Morning Coffee is. We uh, are going to do our share of sharing stories and also a little bit of gossip. Possibly. Possibly some gossip. Very possibly. And uh, now I do want to introduce you to uh, Jennifer Basie Sander. She is, has been a friend of mine, I thought, earlier. Um, met her sometime probably 1982 or so. She was working at Beer's Books. She has blossomed her career. She is an author, a literary historian, the, an editor of, uh, with, uh, she was a former editor of Random House. She has done 50 plus books. Far too many. Far, Far too, too many. many. I think it's up to closer to 70. Something like that. <laughs> and the one we're gonna be yeah. talking about today is Churchill. You can introduce just the title. Sure. Uh, this is Churchill, A Drinking Life, Champagne, Cognac, and Cocktails, uh, which is all about Churchill and his drinking life. <laughs> she also wrote a delightful book on the martini diet. Uh, I tried it, and I, I didn't lose weight. Uh, well, no, that's not the point. It's a, it's a way of living. <laughs> it's it a metaphor. A martini is a metaphor. <laughs> And uh, I am hoping that we can talk her into doing another program here. She wrote The Idiot's Guide to Getting Published. Mm -hmm. And I know a lot of you want to tell your stories and get published. And there was another idiot guide that you did. Um, oh, I've, I did uh, two or three with them. That, that series no longer exists. exists. Um, but I did The Complete Idiot's Guide to Getting Published. Then the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Self-Publishing like dropped out at the last minute. And my editor, remember answering early cell phones like, hello? <laughs> oh, it's my editor who says, didn't you, don't you know something about self-publishing? I said, yeah, it's the same as publishing. It's just you write the check yourself rather than the editor, or, you know, rather than the publisher paying. So yes, I'm also the author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to Self-Publishing. And then also along with a stockbroker um, wrote The Complete Idiot's Guide to Investing for Women. So an illustrious career to say the, uh, the least. Um, one last thing that I wanted to bring up about uh, Jennifer, besides all of the books that she has done, she is a Hemingway scholar. In a very particular niche. And I'm hoping, <laughs> so the talk today is Eat, Drink, Be Literary. Uh, she's going to be talking a lot about Churchill. We're going to do this kind of in three segments. We're going to be talking about that book. Uh, we're going to take a break to ask, uh, answer any questions that are in the audience. And then I wanted to talk, uh, we wanted to talk about women in the literary life that uh, either wrote about and were famous because of drinking. We're gonna talk about Julia Child, MFK Fisher, and those women who drank a little too much. There were some. Mm -hmm. So uh, we're, Coco Chanel is uh, one of them, Dorothy Parker and others. Then we're going to do one more Q&A and mm -hmm. just show you how to do a couple of drinks. We just found out we could have brought alcohol. You know? But oddly enough, I don't have any in the car. <laughs> and it's never a good idea. <laughs> so before we get started, though, I do want to share one thing. I don't know if we can get a close-up. Given enough coffee, I could rule the world. And that is a quote from Julia Child. And this is her signature on the back. Thanks for remembering me to be clear by the example that you set. I don't know who Janera is. I should have done some research on it. But um, I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Julia Child. I collect 
letters from her, and I didn't bring it today because it's too valuable, but I do have cocktail recipes by uh, her husband, Paul. Oh, wow. And I'm going to spring this one on Jennifer. Uh-oh. If you could talk a little bit about Joan Didion and her recipes oh. somewhere in the women's section, because I know sure, you've sure. got I them. Do. Yeah, it's true, I do. Okay, yeah. I'm going to throw it over to Jennifer oh. now. Okay, um, I'll talk a little bit about this book. Uh, which came out uh, early September this year. So it's just been out um, roughly six months or so. Um, and so this was my pandemic project. As, as Mary Ellen was, um, was saying, I, I have written a lot of books, a lot of book projects. Uh, oftentimes publishers ask me to write, you know, this is something that people don't realize so much about the publishing world, is you go into a bookstore and you see all these books and you think, oh, wow, writers, writers had a burning desire to write this book on this particular topic, and here it is on the shelf. Yes, but oftentimes it's publishers who think, I have a burning desire to make a profit, and uh, what is a topic <laughs> that would, would fit well in a book? And then they come up with an idea, and then they ask a writer to write it. So the last, I'd say really the last decade or so of, of most of what the books that are under my name, uh, or under other names with my name in little tiny type, um, are, are ideas that publishers came to me and said, can you do a book about this? Can you put together a book about that? Um, so I've done, I think, eight books with a company called Skyhorse Books in New York. Um, and so, but I was thinking, I want to, you know, it's been a while since I came up with an idea on my own. I would like to have my own project rather than something that somebody's just assigning to me. And so, you know, the world had shut down. Um, I was looking for something to do. So as, as Mary Ellen mentioned, some years ago, almost 20 years ago, I wrote a book called The Martini Diet, which again, was not my idea. It was the publisher who called me up and said, the world needs a book called The Martini Diet, and I think you can write it. And I said, oh, sure, send me the contract. And then it took a long time for me to figure out what was going to be actually in the book, what the martini I was going to be. But again, it was Martini's metaphor for like living, enjoying your life, but doing so in moderation. Enjoying the things that make you happy, but in moderation. Uh, because just like with too many martinis, you know, you just go overboard. So anyway, so uh, here I had written that book under the name Gin Sander. My name is Jennifer, but Gin has always been my, my nickname. I grew up in a house in a mixed marriage. My father drank martinis with olives and my mother drank Gibsons with, with onions. <laughs> so to me, gin drinking was like the ultimate adult, you know, signifier. So yes, I did grow up to be a, a gin drinker. Anyway, so, um, so there are all these wonderful quotes about gin and dry martinis that are attributed to Winston Churchill. You know, that uh, a martini should be so dry that you should pour the gin into the glass and look in the direction of France, you know, where the home of vermouth, you know, <laughs> or that you could pass the vermouth bottle around. <laughs> Um, actually, just a few months ago, my husband and I were at Duke's Hotel in London, which has a very famous bar and a very famous bartender, Alessandro Palazzi, who I quote in here. And when he makes a martini, he pours the vermouth into the glass, swishes it around, and dumps it onto the floor. <laughs> it's very dramatic. Don't try this at home. Um, <laughs> anyway. So I thought, oh, that'll be great. You know, all these great Winston Churchill martinis. Clearly, he was a martini drinker. It would be fun to write a book. Everybody mentions in their big, thick, historic tomes about Winston Churchill that he drank a lot. But nobody has ever just focused specifically on the idea of what he drank and where and with whom and why. Um, we all have our own different whys, I think. <laughs> anyway, so I put together. Uh, what's known as a book proposal, sort of like a business plan. That's how you pitch a, a publisher. Put together this proposal all about Winston Churchill and, and, and what he enjoyed. And the publisher said, great, great idea. Of course you can write that book. I said, great, send me the contract. Uh, but then I started to actually research Winston Churchill and alcohol, and he didn't like gin. <laughs> They're all <laughs> fake quotes. <laughs> Every last one of them, you know, I, I mean, how it's probably even more prevalent now in the world with everything that races around on the internet. But 
you know, so many quotes that we think, oh, so and so, you know, W.C. Fields said this, or you know, um, F.D.R. said that, or Eleanor Roosevelt said that. When you really research a lot of stuff, no, either either they didn't actually say it, or the quote that we are forever putting out there is slightly different from what it was that they actually did say. Anyway, so yeah, so I find out that Winston Churchill doesn't actually like martinis, but at that point I have a book contract. <laughs> so, <laughs> so of course, I then started to research. Um, and also, I, I called my friend Roxanne Langer, who is the co-author. So it's Jin Sander and Roxanne Langer. And Roxanne is a sommelier. Um, I have a, you know, for me, a good bottle of wine is one I can get the cork out of. Roxanne has a very sophisticated palate that uh, operates on a whole different level. Um, and the reason that I knew she was available to help me with this book was because she had been running a small winery down in uh, Bel Air, right across the 405 from the Getty. Can you believe there's an actual vineyard there in in Los Angeles, um, which actually was, it was um, on the property owned by the producer Victor Fleming, the director Victor Fleming, who did uh, Wizard of Oz and Gone with the Wind. Um, and it was the head of a, a, like um, one of the big um, um, airplane manufacturers who started a winery on it. And ultimately it belonged to this other fellow who when the world shut down and the pandemic said, oh man, Roxanne, you know, I just can't, this is just, too frivolous, I can't afford to keep you on. His name is Rupert Murdoch. <laughs> and Rupert Murdoch told Roxanne he couldn't afford to keep <laughs> employing her <laughs> during the pandemic. So I knew that Roxanne was available and I thought, wouldn't it be fun if she could then say to Rupert, because they text and talk all the time still, if she could say, oh, by the way, here's what I'm doing, you know? So I, so I said, um, oh, Roxanne, why don't you ask Mr. Murdoch whether or not he has any Churchill stories? Because he's, you know, I mean, come on, in the media business and everybody, you can pretty much, you know, Google Churchill comma anything and something will come up. Any place, any time, any, anything, some, some connection will come up. So after I said so casually, why don't you tell Rupert you're working on this book and why don't you ask him if he has any Churchill stories? So then, after I said that, I Google Churchill comma Murdoch, <laughs> and then I called her back and said, no, don't call, Mur don't call Rupert, <laughs> not until I talk to you. <laughs> so here's the story, um, World War I, Churchill is the, um, the Secretary of the Navy, the first Admiral of the, Admiral of the Navy, um, and, so, and then Gallipoli happens, which of course it was a terrible, terrible disaster. All of these, you know, uh, all of these soldiers from New Zealand and Australia are just wiped out in a matter of days. Um, and then, you know, World War I is just going on. I mean, that's what happens in war. A lot of people die. But there's this young Australian journalist who is not going to let this drop as a topic. And he writes about it, and he writes about it, and he's in England, and he, he speaks before Parliament, and he writes, and, and he just keeps it, keeps it alive as a topic. And ultimately, he dog, that's one of the major reasons why, why Churchill then resigned his position in the government and went back into the army. Um, and distinguished himself leading a battalion in France in trench warfare, but nevertheless, he resigned. It's called his, you know, his dark period where he was sort of out of favor as a result of that. Well, that was a young Australian journalist named Keith Murdoch, the father of Rupert Murdoch. And that was what, you know, that was what had brought him to prominence to the point where, you know, if you're a hot young guy on the scene, people will loan you money to start buying newspapers. Anyway, so the, the Murdoch empire is built on the back of Winston Churchill and World War I. So I always think, you know, it's so interesting. Anytime you research something or anytime you're reading a history book, you think, well, here's this moment in time that sort of exists in, in amber. But that's not true. As we all know, everything is so interwoven. You know, you pull one little thread and something from this end is gonna come and connect with the moment that you live in now. So to me, that was one of the most fascinating things right off the bat was to see how connected Winston Churchill and World War I and World War II are to what's going on in our lives today. So although this book is about Winston Churchill enjoying a glass or two, it's also all about how everything is connected. Everything is interwoven and history is never really over with it's just, you know, taking a different form, all connected. 
So I, I have to say, a glass or two. Oh yeah! Wow. <laughs> do you want to? He had a okay. voracious okay. appetite. Do you yes, want to talk did. a little bit yeah. about that? Actually, um, it would be a very funny routine. And actually, I think there is somebody online who does this, who kind of goes through Winston Churchill's drinking routine from morning to evening, and by the end of it, is so sloshed he's you know fallen over or something. But here's the thing, Churchill. Um, for all of the liquor that he consumed throughout the day, there are only two instances in which he's ever described as drunk. One is when he's a very young, um, very early in the army, young in his uh, army career, and he falls off his horse coming back from a party. <laughs> and then the other one, also he's fairly young, and he and David Lloyd George, they're both just members of parliament. Lloyd George is not yet the, the prime minister, and they're coming after out after some you know late night session and they're holding each other up as they walk down the street in London. And those are really the only two instances in which he's described as drunk. Because, um, yes, it's true, maybe he would start the day with a little glass of sherry, which is the instruction that he gave to one of the butlers at uh, the White House when he was there with, with FDR. Um, but then primarily what he drank was something that he called a throat moistener. And that was Johnny Walker Red, you know, not the high-end Johnny Walker, not blue label, not green, not black, <laughs> but red, you know, um, all day long, very, very weak with a whole lot of um, scotch and soda, so a whole lot of soda water. It was just really enough to sort of darken the, the glass. Um, so when you see the movies like The Darkest Hour or when Winston, portrayal, uh, Winston Churchill is portrayed in The Crown, he's holding a big glass of very, very dark liquor. That's not really what he drank, but it shows up better on a camera. <laughs> so <laughs> if they actually showed him drinking what he drank, it would just look like he was drinking a glass of water. And so all of the accounts that I read, um, and I read in order to find more interesting, kind of earthier, more human-like uh, moments rather than what's in the big history books. I read all of the memoirs and diaries of the people who worked for him. So I sort of read around Winston Churchill rather than directly into Winston Churchill because I wanted to see how these people would describe what he was doing throughout the course of the day. Um, and so they're the ones who are talking about the weak scotch and soda and needing another scotch and soda. And so that was a really interesting, fun, you know, interviewing or rather uh, research technique. So he, so he would have the throat moistener all day long as he worked. At lunch, he was drinking champagne. He was drinking white wine. He did not like red wine. He kept it on hand, of course, for his guests. But regardless of what he was having for his meal, he always drank white wine. That was just what he preferred. And if you're Winston Churchill, you get to do what you want. <laughs> So Jennifer, in, in the book, you have an inventory of how many, like one month, how many cases of champagne um, um, he went through? Okay, so now there, there's, well, first of all, there's industry speculation. It's not my figure. I didn't do the math. But industry speculation is that over the course of his life, it's 42,000 bottles of champagne. Which, again, I did do the math. Uh, on the, the two things to know are that uh, it's imperial pints, that it, prior to the, e, the creation of the EU, when everything needed to be standardized, um, Great Britain had an imperial pint, which is smaller than what we think of as an ordinary champagne bottle. So admittedly, they were smaller bottles that were being opened. Um, and he probably didn't drink the entire thing on his own. Generally, you know, if you're having champagne, there are other people in the room with you. But nevertheless, 42,000 bottles is what the champagne industry um, talks about. Um, but also, there's this great um, there's this great story about how just after World War II, he goes to Lake Como to kind of you know rest and relax, much much deserved. And so the, the general that has, has created this uh, getaway for him very thoughtfully puts in 100 bottles of Veuve Clicquot. And there are only, I think, six people in, in his party. And after a week, there are only four bottles left. <laughs> so, uh, there was a question? I've always heard that he drank. Oh, sorry. We're going to hold on just a oh, second so, so we can yeah. get a microphone to, oh, okay. to her. Sorry. Microphone? Yes. 
Uh, thank so you so much. So one of the so fun much. things about this book is that it's all about, it's what he liked to drink, where he liked to drink, and who he liked to drink it with. And so the, it's, again, it's kind of a little mini history book with these little snippets and backgrounds about people like Lord Beaverbrook, or Coco Chanel is one of the people that he knew early on because she was a very good horsewoman and a good fisherman. Not because she was a fashion designer, but because she was very sporty. So before the, before the question, we're going to talk about Coco oh. Chanel. Uh -huh. uh, but where I used to like to drink was Lord Beaverbrook, one of oh, Perigary's yeah. first yeah. restaurants. So we'll talk. Yeah. I, I, so can you explain who Lord Beaverbrook he is? He was a press baron. He was actually a Canadian okay. guy. He was a press baron. And during World War, it was an enormously wealthy man. And during World War II, uh, Winston Churchill put him into a number of uh, positions of prominence having to do with supply chains. Great. And we're going to uh, go for the question. Yes. If you can also mention your name, at least your first name. Hi, I'm Joy. Hi. And I've heard that he enjoyed drinking a lot of Paul Roger. Oh, indeed. That was absolutely his favorite champagne because he sat next to Odette Roger, a member of the family, once at a party after World War II, though. So it was from like the you know, late 40s on through the rest of his life. It was all about Paul Roger. But again, he would drink whatever bottle you opened in front of him. <laughs> Not like, yes. Didn't the company call some of their they have, cuvées yes. the, Winston the Winston Churchill, Churchill. Yes, indeed. issue, and yes. it doesn't come out every year? No, it doesn't, because they only want to use the, the very best. It's, they, one came out this past year that I think had been put up a couple of years before. But yes, they did get the permission from the Churchill family in order to do that official Churchill cuvée, which costs a great deal more. I just bought a bottle of Paul Roger to donate with the book to an auction, and it's about $75 for the ordinary Paul Roger. But to get the Churchill, it's considerably more expensive. Yes, it's over mm -hmm. 300 Yes, it is. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to be buying that one. I know, yeah. I'm not donating that one. Sorry, guys. <laughs> All right. So, um, of course, I, I forgot the next question that I was going to, uh, uh, to ask you. Oh. I'm going to switch to cognac. Yes. You will notice that I have a very large bottle. Do you remember? What is this? This is a Jeroboam, or is that oh, larger? Oh, you know, you'd have to. Roxanne wrote those parts. <laughs> it's a <laughs> very a large bottle of, of Cavassier. Yeah. Uh, this is actually from Rudy Valley's collection. My brother, Keith, who you have some of you, he's my co-author uh, in the books that um, I write oftentimes. He is one of the Hollywood memorabilia people, and he befriended Rudy Valley. He bought out a lot of his estate. So um, that was the best bottle of Dom Perignon I've ever had was oh, from wow. Rudy Valley. Wow. This was empty when we got it, Oh, food. I have but to I, say. This is what I love, the little, little, little thing here to pour from, a little spigot. <laughs> Right. Yeah, and boy. we're going to be talking about uh, cocktails in the movies. But do you want to explain just something about his cognac Affection? Um, well, oddly enough, um, in order to make sure that I was writing, you know, properly about cognac and brandy, I went to Daryl Cordy, um, who's a close friend of Roxanne's. They're oftentimes judges in, in various wine competitions. Um, and I said, you know, over and over and over again, as I read these diaries and these descriptions of the course of his ordinary day or what's happening during a, a, a the course of a dinner, they're always drinking old brandy. Nobody's just drinking brandy. They're just drinking old brandy, old cognac. That's always the term. And so I said to Mr. Cordy, why, you know, what's with all the old brandy? Why isn't anybody just drinking a glass of brandy? How is there all this old brandy, this seemingly endless supply of old brandy? He said it's because during World War I, uh, the cognac region was never actually attacked. All, let's see, all cognac is brandy, but not all brandy is cognac, you know, depends on the region. Um, and so cognac was never attacked, but of course the cognac, you know, producers were worried about being attacked, so they bricked everything up. So all of the brandy and cognac was hidden during World War I, never attacked, never, never used, and so after World War I, the world was awash in all of this wonderful stuff that had been hidden away for a couple of years. So that was the explanation. Later on, though, I'm sorry to say, uh, Daryl Coral did call uh, and say, well, I've been reading your book, and my heart just sunk. <laughs> I thought, oh, no. He's I've gonna, had that call. He's going to say that I misquoted him, but he didn't, thank goodness. It all had to do with very sort of small um, um, 
small phrasing in about wine, and I thought, oh, thank God, Roxanne wrote that stuff. <laughs> she can be, she can take care of it with Daryl. But no, he did not say that I misquoted him, so that was a oh, big relief. <laughs> Nothing scarier than a phone call from Daryl Cordy. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the things that you talked about early was the uh, connections. Mm -hmm. So Churchill was in California, but oh. his daughter oh, my had a connection to Sacramento. Uh, Sarah Churchill. Uh, well, Sarah Churchill uh, acted at least once. I know of my parents saw her act at the music circus once. But but quickly though, Churchill, yes, Churchill, that, so again, this was a pandemic project. Everybody says, oh, didn't you have fun researching in London? No, because <laughs> nobody could go anywhere. <laughs> anyway, so, um, so one of the things that we did a deep dive into though were uh, the many, many times that Churchill came to the United States. And he, his first trip, his only trip actually on the West Coast was in 1929, height of prohibition, but yet seemingly <laughs> did not did not change his habits whatsoever. Um, and so at one point, they're driving down the coast, um, and they stop in the Napa Valley. And they have lunch um, with, the, um, with the family that owns uh, Bouilleau Vineyards, BV, um, which ha happened to have uh, a license to produce sacramental wine <laughs> during the <laughs> prohibition. <laughs> so there was still wine on the table. Also, they happened to own a a cognac place in France, <laughs> so it's a French family. Um, anyway, so the fact is that the, uh, the, of course, the winery still exists. The, the vineyards, the wine business has been sold off, but the same family still owns a magnificent estate where Winston Churchill was. And so Roxanne, through her connections in the wine business, um, we were able to to get there and have lunch with the members of the family. And there's the guest book. I have a picture in the book of the guest book with Winston Churchill's signature on it. And here's the best story of all. Um, so prior to this, uh, as they were driving down, they were supposed to stop for cocktails at the home of uh, Paul Verdier, who owned the city of Paris in San Francisco, who had a place up, up the road from, from the lunch spot. And he, stand, he writes in his uh, wine diary that he's standing there out on the road, you know, looking up and down, where's the car? Where, they were supposed to be here at, you know, and, and where are they now? No, they arrive late and too late to have cocktails, so they just go on to the luncheon. And the reason they were late was because they had pulled over and gone skinny dipping in the Russian River. <laughs> <laughs> Which he liked to do. So, if you yes. ever saw the, the yes. movies of him yes. in the bathtub. Yes. Uh, so I am going to ask a little bit, be, uh, and then we're going to segue later into the women um, wine and, and alcohol, but can you talk about some of the women in Churchill's life? Well, so his mother, Jenny, uh, was really quite fascinating, Jenny Jerome. Um, she grew up in New York, and in fact, so in the whole back section of this book, we have cocktail recipes, um, and the recipe for the Manhattan, which of course is a very popular, has always been a very popular drink. Um, I start it by, uh, once again, recounting a tale that turns out to be false that the creation of the Manhattan drink is attributed sometimes to his mother having had a, a political party in New York um, and asked to have a special drink created for it. Um, as it turns out though, you know, when you do do the research, she was living in Europe and she was pregnant at the time, so she couldn't have been, you know, <laughs> she couldn't have been where, where the drink was actually created. Um, so Jenny Jerome, uh, who then married uh, Lord Randolph Churchill, um, was you know just a, a sort of a wild woman, always spent far too much money. Okay, well, um, I'm getting to the garbage habit back, that Winston then. Churchill inherited from his mother. He was always living beyond his means. He was always, and particularly huge bills to, to the wine merchants and the cigar merchants. Um, but the sad ending for Jenny Jerome Churchill, though, is that she, um, one of the things she liked to spend money on uh, were shoes. And so, um, you know, fairly late in her life, this is the way it would have been described, but of course she was really only in her 50s. You know, we don't think that's very late now, but um, she had a pair of beautiful handmade Italian boots made. And then she was walking and she tripped and twisted her ankle, which ultimately became gangrenous. It had to be mm -hmm. amputated. Anyway, that was what, it was a pair of high-heeled shoes that killed her. Handmade Italian boots. It was her fondness for shoes right. that was her ultimate um, cause of death, which is, how sad is that? 
Yeah. Absolutely. I know. Yeah. And we're going to talk. But he was very close to his we're mother. Gonna, we're going to talk about Coco Chanel later, but do you want to say anything about Coco Well, it's because, Coco well, it's because she was the lover of, of you know, of, of an English lord, uh, an extremely wealthy man. Um, and this was when she was fairly young, just starting out. Uh, but again, she was a very good horsewoman, very sporty, um, and also a very good, you know, fisherman, fisher person, fisher woman. Anyway, she could fish. <laughs> I was willing to, you know, stand in waders in a cold uh, stream in Scotland. Uh, so largely this all took place in, in Scotland at hunting lodges. And that was where Winston Churchill first knew Coco Chanel. Again, not because she was a famous designer, but because she was the, the girlfriend of one of his friends and, and was good on a horse and good in a stream. <laughs> <laughs> all right, before we move on to the, what the, the real women's section, is there anything that you'd like to add that you haven't said about um, Churchill? Well, I mean, uh, actually, it's, it's more about my friend Roxanne, who, again, not only did I know she was available to help me with this project, but she's so well-connected that I knew we would be able to get stories that other people hadn't found because we're not professional historians mm -hmm. worried about getting tenure or, you know, lecturing and, you know, winning the Nobel for this, that, and the other thing. No, we're just a couple of ladies thinking, well, isn't this an interesting topic? Let's see what we can find out. And so there are two stories in this book which have never, and I have read pretty widely <laughs> about Churchill, never to my knowledge seen the light of day in anybody else's book. And they're both because Roxanne asked questions. So the first one comes from, um, there's a very famous um, wine and and spirits merchant in London called Berry Brothers and Rudd. They're over there in St. James's. They've been in business since the 18th century. And so Roxanne talks to the head of Berry Brothers and Rudd and says, hey, you know, write in this book, do you have any Churchill stories that, you know, we should hear about? And they laughed and they said, oh, gosh, Churchill, oh, boy. Um, <laughs> and that, that, that in the later part of Churchill's life, when he was no longer in government after his second term as, as prime minister, he just wandered all over the world, wasn't very good about keeping anybody informed about where he was. And sometimes the British government wanted to trot him out for, you know, ceremonial purposes or something. So if they needed to find Winston Churchill in the last 15 or 20 years of his life, they called Berry Brothers and Rudd and said, where are you shipping his champagne? <laughs> so that was how the British government kept tabs on Winston Churchill, through Berry Brothers and Rudd. So that was one story. And then another lovely little story comes from the family, the Symington family who own the, uh, all of the port business, which of course port, you know, it all comes from Portugal. Same thing with the sherry business. It's all controlled by English families. Um, so the Symington family controls the port business. And uh, she was talking to the Symingtons, same thing. Do you have any Churchill stories? They said, oh yeah. So um, a member of the Symington family was, you know, during World War I, trench warfare, there he is, you know, down there, ordinary soldier. But his grandfather sends him a case of really good port. And so naturally, in wartime, you share it with your trench buddies. And Winston Churchill was one of the people that he shared this lovely port with. It's the only time they ever met. Ten years later, Churchill is walking down the street in London, and Mr. Symington is there. Maurice Symington is walking towards him. He's on business there in London. And Churchill stops, looks at him, points, and just says, port. <laughs> so, <laughs> again, never forgot the face of somebody who poured him a really good drink. <laughs> Even with, you know, missiles and bombs whizzing overhead. <laughs> he knew exactly who that port had come from. So, again, again these are charming stories, which, because... Because historians didn't ask the liquor business, you know, and we did. <laughs> so, right. Good. so, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm enormously proud of those two stories and Roxanne's ability to ferret out information. Good. Before we make the transition, any more questions from the audience? None? All right. So we're going to, uh, this is Women's History Month, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know if we can get a slide up. We had a, a, a two sl a slides, one had quotes. Do you have that one? All right, oh, so I, I'm going to, uh, and you guys, can you, you guys can't see this, but if you're at home, you're gonna see four quotes. We've got Julia Child, Dorothy Parker, MFK Fisher, Coco Chanel. Do you wanna read the quotes? I, we're gonna ask you to match the quote to the person. Okay, so there it? are four different quotes. The first one is, one martini is just right, two martinis are too many, three martinis are never enough. I enjoy cooking with wine. Sometimes I even put it in the food. 
I only drink champagne on two occasions, when I'm in love and when I'm not. And then another martini one. I like to have a martini, two at the very most. Three, I'm under the table. Four, I'm under the host. <laughs> so yes, Julia Child, Dorothy Parker, MFK Fisher, or Coco Chanel. Anyone? Anyone, Anyone want to uh, attribute any of those quotes? Yeah. Um, I can. Uh, you, is it? Is Julia Child the cooking with wine? Sometimes oh, I put it in the food. Yes. <laughs> yes. Right. And what we'll do is, is we'll answer the questions we go through uh, oh, each okay. one. Okay. Uh, so you are right. And it's no secret that Julia Child liked to drink. I have to say. Uh, and does everyone know who Julia Child is? I mean, is that something even for the, the uh, audience? She is the, uh, was the author of countless uh, books. Of course, the most important one was The um, Art of French Cooking. Mastering the Art of Mastering French. Mastering the Art Mastering of French it. Cooking. Mm -hmm. uh, there have been so many movies mm -hmm. and television shows based on that, uh, including the, the new one. But she really, because she drank at every taping, mm -hmm. she would have white wine and red wine. Uh, and it was the first time there were no ads allowed, am I right, for alcohol at that time? Um, I, I think earlier it was permitted, and then sometime in the 60s maybe it was, it right. was yeah, legislated so, against. Uh, it mm -hmm. stopped. But one of the things is because of, of uh, prohibition, wine drinking especially had kind of stopped. People weren't drinking it as much. But her imbibing uh, very definitely brought the whole wine thing Back. It back, really yeah. affected. Well, it made it look ordinary. It made yes. it look uh, also ordinary. sophisticated. Yes, I believe right. also added to that effect was the idea that that after World War II, here come all these guys back from Europe, where they've been. You know, you couldn't always get a glass of water, but you could always get a glass of wine. You know? Right. <laughs> or find an abandoned farmhouse with a good stock of cognac. Um, so it was also that combined. Yeah, there were several things that came together. But yes, she familiar. She she normalized it for women particularly. I think. Mm -hmm. Right. And really contributed to the wine industry coming back in California. Um, I never had the good fortune of meeting her. I think you did. Am no, I right? I'm, oh, well, no, I never met her. But yes, I have been in the same room as Julia Child. <laughs> but it was a very large room. <laughs> it was a big convention of uh, food writers, the international, the IACP, International Association of Culinary Professionals, at a big conference in San Francisco. Yes. And mm -hmm. she started uh, Copia. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Food and Wine Society is mm -hmm. all over, Pro prolific writer. If you want to know more about her, you can go to the Smithsonian, and they have recreated her, her, whole kitchen. her entire kitchen. Mm -hmm. She is still the most watched chef on television. Oh, really? Wow. Every one of the early programs, if you are, I'm going to put in a plug, Ted, sorry for, for KPIE. If you are a passport holder for PBS, you can see almost every program that she ever did. Uh, another connection um, that I had is one of the chefs she worked with a lot was Jacques Pepin. And I had the good fortune at the same time I was meeting you, 1982, William, Sino uh, no, William Glenn William had Glenn. a cooking school. Mm -hmm. Julia Child actually cooked at that school, mm -hmm. as did James Beard, mm -hmm. Marion Cunningham, mm -hmm. and others. But I took a three-day class from uh, Jacques Pepin. He literally used everything. There was no waste. By the time that three oh, really? days was open, uh, he had one little thing of garbage. Wow. That was it. Wow. But what he would do at the end of every session is he would take onions, um, berries, or whatever. And he, those were the inks that he created for doing illustrations. Oh, that's fabulous. And so he taught wow. us not only to cook, but to the, to the others, and I've had the good fortune of now meeting him three different uh -huh. times. So that's my connection Charming. story. Um, did you have anything else you wanted to say on Julia Child? Well, that when I was writing the Martini Diet, again, you know, it wasn't my idea. They, you know, the world needs this book. Sure, send me a contract. Um, and and then I thought, oh, that's right, Julia Child. I could, you know, my whole idea of martinis as metaphor. Just you should, you know. You know, you should just always do what you enjoy, but 
but do it in moderation because otherwise, you know, one martini is great, two martinis, eh, you might get a little sloppy, three martinis, you're going to wreck your credit and have to leave town, you know? So, <laughs> so use that as your approach to chocolate fudge or, or creamy sauces or such. Uh, anyway, so I thought, you know, Julia Child, I could just, I could just, because Julia Child had, very conveniently, um, just turned 90 when I was first working on the martini diet. And in an interview with Esquire magazine, uh, the interviewer had said, so what's the secret to a long life? And she said, red meat and gin. <laughs> and I thought, well, there you go. <laughs> so, so I did send her a, a, a note to say, uh, I just want you to know I am basing this whole thing on you. you know? <laughs> I don't want you to hear about it from somebody else afterwards. I just want to tell you now what I am doing. And I got a very sweet uh, postcard back from her. This was just, she was living down in Santa Barbara at the swanky retirement home, Casa Madronia or whatever it's called. Um, and so I got a lovely little postcard back from Julia Child in, in Santa Barbara saying something like, um, you know, as you know, I cannot endorse things, but, you know, good luck with your project sort of a, sort of a thing. And it's someplace, someplace right. I'll pull out my Julia Child uh, So uh, I want, I'm going to, we're going to keep on going, but I am going to invite him. Ted just brought in something. At the very end, please stay with us because I want to have Ted Fong talk about the new ACC Wellness Park uh, and our new cookbook that we're going to be working on. So she was famous for the upside down martini recipe. Yeah, that doesn't I, I sound have that it. appealing to me, but okay. So what she would do is, um, and you talked about, you know, some people swirl it and dump the vermouth. Spritz yeah. or whatever. Yeah. I like hers. She actually uses one fifth. It's a reverse. Yeah, it's upside a reverse. down. It's, it's a five upside to down. one. Yeah, FDR famously did a three to one. Uh, three portions gin to one portion of vermouth, and a lot of people thought that was a little too vermouth forward. But yeah, the idea of five to one, five times the vermouth as you put in the gin is is just a glass of vermouth, but okay. <laughs> right. And one of her other drinks that she liked to do, because she didn't always drink, uh, when she was on camera, uh, she would sometimes want it to look like something else. She would take six ounces of Perrier water, mm -hmm. sparkling water, and a dash of, uh, I can never pronounce Angostura, it. Angostura. Angostura bitters, bitters, which I was going to bring, but I can't afford them. Oh. They are so fresh, and and we didn't bring champagne either because I couldn't get a bottle for less than fifty eight ninety nine. Well, not at six in the morning or whatever. Not at time six in the morning. Yeah, that was you were right. She knew what time I was uh, <laughs> at Smart and Final in Rayleigh's. So uh, I want to do a little switch, a little bit to M F K Fisher. How many of you heard of Mary Francis? Mary Francis yeah. Fisher. Um, I have every one of her books. Oh, wow. I have to say, um, I used to have them in first edition. <laughs> I've been selling them off because they're worth a lot of money <laughs> to buy more books. So we are both book collectors, mm -hmm. I have to say. Um, but MFK Fisher, um, um, made, she was, I think, the best food and wine writer that has ever been produced. She settled and uh, eventually down in Glen Ellen. Yeah, there are no wonderful one. books um, about her that, um, sorry about that, I got distracted by it. But uh, one of the things that I was going to say is she really reminisces about the meals that she ate, the what she drank at every meal. So I'm going to ask you a question. Oh, dear. If you had to reminisce oh. about a particular meal or drinks, what story would you share? Uh, I would have to just delve back into my life from a few months ago <laughs> 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 because it was so unusual. So there we were. So again, I wrote this during the pandemic. You couldn't go anywhere. I'm, we're just on the phone or sending emails to research things or I'm you know, marking up books. Um, but then when the world finally did open up, just at the end of October, early November, um, my husband and I went to, went to London. Um, and so we stayed at Duke's Hotel. Um, the bartender, Alessandro, I had reached out to him. Um, he's Instagram famous. I mean, you know, there are just people who are like, it's um, astonishing the numbers of people who have a huge followers on Instagram. And so I had reached out to him through Instagram to say, I'm working on this book. Um, if by chance 
through some warp in the universe, if Winston Churchill had wa walked into your bar now, what would you serve him? And so I'm telling you, I got the sexiest phone mail message from, well, Jennifer, <laughs> if <laughs> Sir Winston Churchill walked into my bar now, I would, anyway, it was like, oh, I still have it saved. <laughs> Listen to it every so often if I need to get perked up. Um, but <laughs> so in addition to him, to Alessandra, you know, being Instagram famous, how all this stuff. There's also this great guy in England, um, Win Stan. His name is his real name is Stan, but he he is the Winston tribute. We would call them impersonators. That kind of a tacky sound. Mm -hmm. So it's a he does a tribute to Winston Churchill. But he's the person that gets invited to official things. I mean, he's at Blenheim. He's at Highclere Castle. Um, you know, at Goodwood races. They he if they need a Winston Churchill lookalike, Win Stan is the guy that comes. So I had been corresponding with him. There are all these charming pictures of him standing in front of Blenheim Palace reading this book or at High Clare. Or now his, uh, he has an aide that travels with him, looks very official, carries the big red dispatch box. Well, what's in the dispatch box? A copy of this book. <laughs> anyway, so he came and met us for drinks at Duke's. So there we were, literally sitting in this famous bar, which is the bar where in Fleming, um, decided that James Bond was going to be drinking a drink called the Vesper. That's one of their claims to fame. So here we are at Duke's Bar, uh, sitting, just me and David, with Win Stan, who looks just like Winston Churchill. <laughs> and it was just such an unusual experience. To have all, because as you can imagine, I heard afterwards from Alessandra, he said, you wouldn't believe the things that people say, oh my God, would you, <laughs> like, you know? <laughs> so apparently we were like the focus of everybody's attention, <laughs> but it was just such an, I mean, when do you get to sit there drinking a martini with somebody who looks and sounds and acts <laughs> just like Winston Churchill? <laughs> so that was really sort of the, the key moment in this whole project. But other than that, I would say probably the thing that I blush now to think about, but you know, in the wine world, everybody talks about the Chateau Lafitte, the Chateau La Tour from the early 60s, mm -hmm. how that was sort of the best thing ever. Well, when I first went away to college, my boyfriend was a Saudi Arabian prince. Um, and so there was just all hold, this. Hold on. I know. Sorry. <laughs> really? Oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, so a Saudi prince, and so as you can imagine, there were these enormous meals, there was all this stuff, but I was this, you know, 18-year-old girl from Sacramento. Sure, I had had wine before. I grew up in a reasonably sophisticated California home, but <laughs> I, I was like, you know, they pour it, and I'm thinking, God, it looks kind of muddy, you know? <laughs> it looks, there's like dust at the bottom. Anyway, I never did complain, thank goodness, because it was years later when I start reading about wine and I can see the labels, I think, oh, well, that's the stuff that they were serving. And here, thank goodness, I never did say, can I get a glass that's not muddy? You know, I was drinking <laughs> the world's most famous wine <laughs> and I thought there was something wrong with it because I was so unsophisticated. I so, love it. Oh, well. Good. If only Our I, I should have <laughs> kept a bottle. <laughs> So uh, we're going to switch a little bit. You talked a little bit about Coco Chanel, who was mm -hmm. a fashion icon. So when I was growing up, my mother, um, and I was never thin, oh. my, my mother thought that Coco Chanel was like the epitome oh, gosh, of yeah. femininity. And so she always told me that a woman is always well-dressed. If mm -hmm. you're like Coco Chanel, basic, black, basic. am I right? Mm -hmm. um, and also costume jewelry, not the, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not the real thing. Nope, the fakes. real thing was ostentane, uh, ostentatious. Oh, yes. Yes. It wasn't that we had Bad no money taste. to no, be no, able no. to do anything. Bad uh, she also told me that I could not accept a gift from a man unless it was worth at least $10. <laughs> now, this was when I was <laughs> a, a kid. And on my 16th birthday, my first date, uh, the young man I was with gave me some earrings from um, from wine stocks that I knew were on sale for $2, <laughs> and I gave them back. Oh. Okay. And uh, she also always had these little quilted purses. Uh, she introduced the world to Chanel Number no. 5, which is, uh, along with Poison, still my 
favorite, favorite. Quick, quick uh, liquor Chanel okay. thing. The bottle that, you know, that famous iconic square little bottle shape for a Chanel right. number five. It is based on the whiskey flask that her boyfriend, Bo Boy Capel, used to carry with him. Oh, my That's gosh. where that, yeah, well, again, that I, had, I didn't know that until I was researching this book and trying to weave everybody together. Yeah, right. it's, a, it's a whiskey bottle from her, from, yeah, <laughs> the 1920s. Well, one of the things that I liked about Coco Chanel was that I could actually afford to buy her drink at the Savoy Hotel in London. Oh, yes. And um, so there's a drink that is named after her. Uh, and the other thing is there's, if you go to the Savoy, which is one of my favorite hotels, one of my favorite books is the Savoy cocktail the Savoy, book. Very famous cocktail book. Very Savoy, famous yeah. cocktail mm -hmm. book. Uh, you can go in for a drink, 35 mm -hmm. to $50 mm -hmm. sometimes for a drink. Mm -hmm. uh, very expensive. Not quite as expensive as the Hemingway Peach Bellini at Harry's Bar, but she'll talk about that one <laughs> later. Really? Uh, I have Thanks to say, for the <laughs> uh, and Marlena Dietrich, can you talk at, 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 at all about the Savoy Hotel and cocktails? Uh, well, okay, so the Savoy had a very, very famous bartender whose name was Joe. I'd have to look it up. <laughs> the last name might have been Joe Gilmore, but isn't he like a jazz musician? I don't know. Anyway, so uh, Joe, uh, so over the years at the Savoy, the bartender would invent drinks in honor of people like like right. Coco or Marlene. And, and there are several that are named after Winston. Like there's one called the Blenheim, that, which is right. the... the it's the palace that belonged to the Churchill family, but his father was the second or third son, so it belongs to one of his cousins. Uh, but, but that was where Winston Churchill was born, was at Blenheim Palace. Um, and so the Blenheim was invented at the Savoy. Uh, it's called the American Bar, because during Prohibition, um, you know, what an idea. Let's say you can't do this, and so everybody wants to do that. You know, of course, it, it created this whole a whole world around it. And so the American bars all through in Paris and in um, England all were influenced by the cocktail craze that, that came uh, about during mm -hmm. Prohibition. Um, because if you're drinking kind of rot gut, you know, whatever somebody is producing, the, you make it taste better by adding other things to it, you know, by having a cocktail that's, that's got maybe a fruit flavor added to it or some juice or something. It hides the crummy taste of of this poorly produced uh, alcohol. Um, so he, so there's the, the Blenheim, and then I'm blanking out, maybe the other one is just called the Churchill. It's just called the yeah, Churchill. Yeah, the Churchill, yeah. But again, it's, it's all so, so many drinks came out of the Savoy, and they have, I mean, it's a big famous Churchill spot now. It's a very Churchillian right. spot. Also, the Churchill uh, room, if you travel anywhere in the world, almost every city has a oh. Churchill bar somewhere. Oh, yeah. Uh, they're everywhere. Yeah. They're, it, you know, Spokane, Washington has a state has joint too. called Churchill. I mean, <laughs> it's, it, which I can tell you he was never there. But you know where he was? He spent the night in Willits on, his, on that trip in Willits? 1929. Yes, Winston Churchill spent the night in Willits. Uh, he also spent the night at the Eureka Hotel on his way down. Um, those are the two, uh, Grants Pass, I don't remember where he stayed in Grants Pass. But yeah, driving down, they had taken the train across Canada and they were coming down this way. And then of course, they ultimately were down at Hearst Castle. Great, mm -hmm. so I'm gonna switch to Dorothy Parker, who is my personal uh, favorite growing up. Um, I loved her, both her poetry, her wit, and the Algonquin Round Table mm -hmm. in New York. So I was fascinated uh, by all of that. We have connections with um, her as well. I have to tell you, there's a, a woman friend of mine, Ariane Laidlaw, that um, was friends with one of the Algon uh, Algonquin, Robert Benchley. Oh, Benchley, she wow. She stayed actually when, uh, uh, at his place where the people from the Algonquin would, would actually um, mm -hmm. would go as well. And Dorothy Parker ended up not only writing for The New Yorker, being part of the Algonquin, but she ended up going to Hollywood, um, as did, by the way, MFK Fisher. They both became screenwriters. But Dorothy Parker would write bits for Bob Hope, wow. Bing Crosby, and Dorothy L'Amour for the On the Road Series. pictures. Yeah. And my mother's cousin was the main writer for all that mm -hmm. and worked with her as well and did like 40 wow. of the things and was quite a drinker, I've understood myself. Mm. Um, one of the things that, and I'm gonna actually read this one because it's too delicious not to, she was also an alcoholic. So there are yes. women who have just imbibed too much. Mm -hmm. 
suffered from depression, and during her later years, she would end up going to a sanitarium to dry out. And this is my favorite one. She told the doctor that she loved the room, but that she needed to get out of the hospital every hour uh, or so for a drink at the local bar. <laughs> and the doctor told her that if she did that, she would be dead within 30 days. And she said, promises, promises. <laughs> So that is a little bit about uh, Dorothy Parker. Are there some other women, or do you want to switch a little to switch it up? Oh, be before we get to that, Hemingway next. Oh. Drinking in the <laughs> movies. Oh yes, yes. I love. I don't know if anybody else is addicted to Turner Classic Movie oh, yes. and classic movies. Yes. Uh, but one of the things is that in every The Thin Man, you name it, there is always alcohol. It's true in television programs. There's always glasses, cut crystal, and ice mm -hmm. that does not melt. Yeah. I've never been able to figure out how they do that. Do you want to make any comments about drinking in the movies? Well, again, I think it's, it's so tied in with, um, with the idea that cocktails were seen as sophisticated, right. that sophisticated people drank. Um, and that that's, that was sort of the lifestyle that particularly during the Depression when nobody had any money, nobody had you know, any kind of glamour in their lives, they could go to the movies and they could see this fabulous fantasy life that other people were living or not really living because it was the movies. Um, but yeah, it was this symbol of casual sophistication. And so I think that was one of the things that sort of drove the popularity, the mm -hmm. ultimate popularity of, of cocktails. But the Thin Man, my gosh, the Nick and Nora stuff, how, you know, how could they stand up straight with all of <laughs> But, but it, there, there, there's actually a cocktail glass called a Nick and Nora, which is a very small, I mean, you know, a martini glass can be you know, huge, but a Nick and Nora is really kind of a, a modest portion. So just like with, with Churchill drinking the severely watered down scotch and soda, you know, maybe that's the answer. If you're just drinking out of a small glass and you have two and it looks like you have had two drinks, maybe they're smaller drinks. But it really, I mean, it looks glamorous to me, but no, I couldn't, you know, I have one martini and that's it. Two martinis, I am in trouble. Good. Mm -hmm. And so because you do the Hemingway and you've done more than once, am I right, that um, you go to Hemingway conferences? Yes, the whole Hemingway thing came from the Getting Published book. I would give a lot of talks to, to writers about how to get published and in order to keep, I mean, you know what it's like when you give public talks, you want to keep yourself interested as well as your audience. And so you're always adding in new material and kind of switching it up. And so writers would say, oh, it's so hard to get published nowadays. Even Hemingway couldn't get a book deal. And I thought, oh, really? <laughs> I don't know. Let's see about that. <laughs> so, so that was kind of a fun little um, exercise for me to call people in the book business and say, or the, you know, agents and editors and say, hey, what do you think? Could Hemingway get a book deal? And some people, a very famous agent said, no, look at, look at his spelling, look at it, no. You know? <laughs> but another one said, oh God, yeah, you know, what a great backstory, you know, because that's what, it's hard to get a book review nowadays, so you want lifestyle articles. So the idea of this young guy who volunteers, he's in the ambulance corps, he gets wounded, he comes back, and oh, great backstory. Um, but as a result of that, yes, I gave a talk at the Hemingway Conference in Oak Park, Illinois, and I thought, well, that's the only my only expertise was talking about Hemingway and publishing. But then they said that the next one was going to be in Paris. And I thought, well, you know, maybe there's some other topic I can think of. So you could talk about anything having to do with, with Paris during the 1920s when Hemingway was there. Mm -hmm. And so I ultimately wrote about American composers like Aaron Copeland, who were there at the same time. And I wove everybody together in this moment. It was a lot of you know, ultimately, Aaron Copeland in the 50s scored a lot of the Hemingway teleplays that were produced. Um, so it was fun to weave everybody together there. But yes, Hemingway, the Hemingway bar at the Paris Ritz mm -hmm. is, of course, fabulous. And it opens at 6 o'clock. No, maybe it opens at 4. Anyway, you have to go very early and sort of stand in line if you want to be able to have a drink at the Hemingway bar. So yeah, again, he's so famously um, liquored up, shall we say. <laughs> yes. Good. So uh, we're going to show you how to mix a couple of drinks, mock mocktails, because we didn't realize we could bring the same thing. Are there any more questions from the audience or that uh, called in before we get to those? 
Oh, the rest of the oh, quotes. Oh, the yes. quotes. It's Chanel who said, I only drink sh you know, champagne two times when I'm in love and when I'm not. Yeah, that Dor much I can do. Dorothy <laughs> Parker, I like to have a martini, two at the very most. Three, I'm under the table. Four, I'm under the host. Uh, and what I love, we talked about being historians, and um, I'm starting to take historian out because I'm not an academic historian. Uh, and, and I have to say, one of the things that I loved about uh, Jennifer one day, she actually said, you know, my books are kind of frivolous. Frothy. 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 That's the word I decided. Frothy, yes. which, which Frothy. seems kind of, um, you know, perfect. Uh, but we do try to just pick up the character or the flavor most mm -hmm. of the time from what we do. But I do get to be a perfectionist. Is this really true? Did this really happen? And she probably didn't actually do the quote. She quoted it. Somebody wrote it this way, and then she claimed it for her own. Oh, really? Oh, well, that's kind of So nice. I wanted to say this. I also, yes. uh, I have my phone on. For those people in Renaissance that are calling me, knowing that we're doing a television program, watch this instead. Oh, ooh, ouch. I've gotten three phone calls from Renaissance people. Yes, Joy, while well, I get this stuff. Oh, yes. Um, I want to say something about Castle. <laughs> oh, OK, okay. yes. Uh, yes. Oh, yes. Wouldn't we all want to be in Rick's bar? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, was, I think that's what I wanted to say. I don't know what else to say, but uh, one of my favorite one of folk artists is the whole thing about him in Paris and all that. And again, I, I mean, when we think about, you know, why, why is it that we sort of feel different when we have a cocktail or a drink in our hand. It's oftentimes it's because of the images that we've been shown from the movie. So in Casablanca, the bar setting is, you know, that's where all the heroism and the bravery gets acted out when people stand up and sing or when they, you know, so so again to us it's sort of heroic. We're 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 trying to be different versions of ourselves, I think, when we're holding a cocktail somehow. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. I'm going to make Jennifer make this drink. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called a lime fizz. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's funny because you can now just buy it straight out of the bottle, I have to say. But a lime fizz is you can add gin. Uh, I did this one because of gin, gin. sander. And we just start off with some ice, however much ice you want to put in. She gets to shake. I was always bad at shaking. So have you ever had a cocktail named after you? Uh, I, I named one after myself. In the <laughs> martini diet, there's one called a gin sander, altogether gin sander. And it's basically a martini with the stuff that was growing in my garden at the time. Uh, <laughs> so it's got a little bit of lavender floating in it and uh, there were one or two other things. I don't remember quite what. Okay, okay so this. And, and this drink normally has uh, cilantro, but I went to two stores this morning. Mine froze in my garden. This okay. is a combination of... I'm hoping, Marge, it was both lime, am I right? And orange. And, oh. and oranges. So That's good. Normally, this is all limes, but okay. I am I going to do the whole thing? Either. You're going to put the whole thing okay. in. Okay, all right. All right. And then you're going to go about the same amount of seltzer. Okay. How's that? Now, normally what you would do is muddle. Do you want to explain what muddle is? Um, yeah, muddle is a great word. We all feel muddled sometimes. And uh, with muddling, you take, uh, you take your herbs or your flavoring, put it, and then you've got a pistol. Or maybe sometimes you could just muddle with a spoon. And so you are smashing it up in order to release the oils and the essences from whatever herb or flour you are right. muddling. Mm -hmm. Okay. And now you put the top on. All right. And you, and you shake Hope it up. there are no live wires in case. <laughs> oh, yes, this uh -oh. is actually already, already. Uh, We're going to stir, not shake. Yes, OK. So pretend. I'll, I'll muddle it. Muddled. muddled. She's muddled. Yeah. I can only, I have to take the blame for this since this is my, my uh, cocktail so, shaker. And, that and I, I collect cocktail shakers, but they're all oddball sizes, shapes, and uh, uh, taste. This is, I couldn't afford the Perrier Jouet 
Bet you got the glasses. Champagne, but I so do the have the glasses, glasses, and we just yeah. found out I have 12, yes. she has four. So yeah. we're going to have oh, a party yeah. of 16. Party. Yeah. So normally there would be cilantro in this as, as well. That would taste really, really good. And I'll let you drink it. Oh, wow. I didn't know I was going to have to do that part. Too. Now you can also <laughs> Cheers. add ginger beer to this drink. Uh, I accidentally <laughs> brought ginger ale instead of ginger. Oh, yummy. But Lots try that. Vitamins. And this is hibiscus ginger beer, so you oh, can add yeah. that if you want. Mm. No, so when it's good it, on its own. Very Just good yeah, on its oh, own. Yeah, it's just a nice citrus flavor. Right. So uh, before we kind of wrap up, one of the other things that I wanted to uh, ask, you can have an answer or not. Uh -oh. When is it okay? Because my mom always told me you couldn't drink until it was 5 o'clock. My mom was a non-drinker. There was only one time that she was ever drunk. One time, to the best of my knowledge. What had knowledge, you done? <laughs> my, parents, you <laughs> my parents never went out. They went out one time to a party. My mom came home at 2 o'clock in the morning giggling. And then she started crying. I killed the fishies. I killed the fishies. And she'd had a martini and thought that she, she had had a couple of martinis, thought that she had rested on the top of an aquarium oh. and it fell in <laughs> and the fishies died. So, <laughs> But I'm just wondering, why is it OK for us to have uh, champagne, Ramos Fizz, some of those morning drinks well, for brunch? Good, yeah. But otherwise, we're supposed to wait till after five to drink. I, again, I think, OK, so, so there's a lot going on in the United States, particularly. And we do sort of still have kind of puritanical you know, roots. And so the idea of doing something as frivolous and frothy as having a drink, drinking alcohol, um, you, know, you save it for later in the day after you have finished, completed all of your tasks for the day, um, done your hard work. Um, but then on the weekend, when you're having brunch, then maybe you can, you know, because all you're doing is, you know, what, mowing the lawn or, uh, you know, or what else are you doing on the weekend? Anyway, you know, washing the windows maybe. Anyway, they're lighter weight tasks, and so perhaps you can have a drink earlier in the day because it's celebratory, because it's a special occasion. I don't think that our forefathers and foremothers would have approved of us brunching every day and starting off with a mimosa. But, you know, we make our own rules. That you know? is so true. So we're all adults here. You get to be in Great. charge of, of how you live your life. So uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about ACC in just a minute and upcoming morning coffees. Any more questions from the audience, though? What did you just make? This was called a lime fizz. Mm -hmm. And if she had really had time to shake it, Sorry. it would fizz quite a bit. Um, it would be, yeah, the interaction between the But it's the really the, 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 you know, the sparkling. Yeah, and the, am I right? He only drank, Churchill was water. only, did Perrier, was, uh, am I wrong? Um, I, I don't know that I came across that. Oh, and here is, for those of you yes. at home. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. I forgot the almond extract and the ginger beer. Oh, oh. well. <laughs> We'll send it for back. you at home, you're going to see this, a fourth of a cup of fresh lime juice. Uh, I happen to have a lot of tangelos left over, so we added it. Good. Uh, the fresh cilantro, a dash of almond extract, but that's from a Cormac Schmick, and I don't think it adds anything at all. I think it was blatant uh, commercialism on their part, so I didn't include it. One cup of ginger beer and then the fresh cilantro just mm -hmm. all yeah. shaken up. But you can make it any way that you want to. That is the reality. All right, so um, any, any more questions? So I want to thank everyone. I especially want to thank Jennifer. She is a wonderful uh, friend. If I can put in one more shameless plug, um, I have been involved in publishing in some capacity. I wrote my first play at nine. <laughs> uh, and I ended up getting, I got my degree at Sac State. I ended up working for 10 speed press down in uh, San Francisco for a long time. I probably helped 200 people get their books in print. Wow. Uh, some of them legitimate. <laughs> some oh, of them self-published. There's a difference between indie publishing, which we'll talk about to me, and self-publishing. 
uh, uh, but also getting people to work with traditional publishers. And if I could tell you how many times people said, I would have someone come to me and say, you need to write that book. The first one was in 1974. I was doing women's networking all across the country. Uh, and Ten Speed said, we want to write that. We want to do that mm -hmm. book. And I said, oh, I don't have time. I'm doing oh. workshops. I don't have time. And, and a woman who took my class, Marilyn Motes Kennedy, mm. oh, yeah. wrote a book called Teamworks. Mm -hmm. uh, so she ended up doing that book instead. And it, this has happened countless times where I just didn't have time. I ended up ghostwriting, mostly academic stuff. Uh, two really best-selling books that I will say now are in the job search category. But the people have died, but I still have an NDA. <laughs> I'm still not allowed to say what. You can ask me. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't sign Not off the NDA. same person, by oh. the way. Uh, two different people. <laughs> that one. Um, but I never got around to doing my own book. So one day, Jennifer called me up and said, well, I was about eight months out. She goes, I'm doing a book called Dog with Old Soul. The Dog with the Old Soul, an anthology. Harlequin, for a short time anyway, had a nonfiction right. arm. <laughs> so they had called and asked me to put together an anthology of, of right. dogs, uh, heartwarming animal stories. So I think, I think I was 60 at the time, and she asked me to submit something, and I didn't do it, and I didn't do it, and I didn't do it. <laughs> and then one day, she called me up at 8 in the morning and said, the deadline is 5 o'clock today. That's right. And I sat down. This is a story that was called Too Many Cats in the Kitchen. And I finally sat down and submitted it. It's now been put into three anthologies. Puppy Love. I was going to mm -hmm. bring the Puppy books love. here. Uh, but because that article was... Uh, extracted in Google Books, I did have a real publisher call me and say, we really like your writing. And so we would like you to write a book for us. And I still haven't written that book, but that's when I did. <laughs> <laughs> that's, but uh, yeah, that book still is, is on the, the books. But uh, uh, that's when I did my last Restaurants of Sacramento mm -hmm. book, and I've done a lot more. So without, I want us to give all an applause, because I wouldn't have done that if it hadn't been oh. for Jennifer Thank pushing you. me to do it. <laughs> and one other connection that I for, uh, forgot, I was working with Jennifer was at Prima Publishing before she went to Random House. And we did a book by Lindsay Shear, which was um, the Chez Panisse dessert book. Oh, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and Wayne Tebow was the, mm -hmm. illustrator. the illustrator of that. But he was also the illustrator of, I can never pronounce, Brillette Sever, the um, a bri brilliant Sever. Ph Physiology yes. of yes. Taste yes. that MFK Fisher did. Mm -hmm. So more, more stuff. So yes. a round of applause for Jennifer. And then I want to put a, a plug in next month's morning coffee. Same, it's going to be whatever that date is in April, and it's called We Are Where We Eat. You know, Elaine Corn and I years ago shop. got funding to okay. do a project where we captured the stories of the people who grow, cook, distribute our food, about 70 different interviews. We're going to actually have some individuals that were interviewed then. We also have a group, Marge Tarbell, I want to thank her for helping out, is uh, we have a group called Altered Egos, Alter yeah. Egos, which is kind of a reader's theater. And they don't know it yet, but I'm going to be asking <laughs> them <laughs> to join me that day as well for morning coffee. So we want you to be able to come back for that. The other thing we're working on before I introduce Ted is David Suhu, Elaine Korn, and I, and quite a few members here. Are, it's not going to be actually produced until sometime in September, but we're extending the deadline. It was February 25th. We're now going to be able to go out almost to April 15th. Mm -hmm. um, Although we might wait for the big day of giving, we really want to encourage you to give money to ACC. Uh, I've been doing a lot of programs um, here as well as other people. So uh, please contribute res recipes. It's on the website. And if you want to volunteer, you can. And now I want to turn this over to Ted Fong. He's the reason that I'm here as well. I want to thank Sean Hidalgo, uh, Danny Lee, uh, the other support here. But there is a new ACC wellness center that is being planned, and I'd like Ted to talk about it for a few minutes. Thank you, Mary Ellen. My name is Ted Fong. I'm the development officer at ACC Senior Services, and one of the originators of this type of online programming that Mary Ellen, through the last couple years, has helped right. us build. Uh, to date, we've live streamed more than 2,000 classes, workshops, and concerts wow. from this location 
out on the patio and in the community. And uh, I'm pleased to announce that uh, this program is alive and well thanks to your support, not just uh, your monetary support, but coming up with ideas for programs. And Mary Ellen has been a huge part of that, um, producing some of our most innovative and interesting programs like the one you saw today. Jennifer and Mary Ellen, thank you so much thank for you. gracing us with your terrific storytelling. <laughs> thank you. And um, it's kind of an ironic segue that we talk about after all this liquor talk, <laughs> ACC Wellness Park. <laughs> but, you know, it is what it is. Um, <laughs> the picture speaks for itself. Uh, you can't see it, but on the back lawn, we have two acres of unoccupied wow. gopher fields. <laughs> it was, used to be a soccer field for the school that was here previously. And we have decided as of last year to develop that into a multi-use outdoor and indoor facility for health and wellness. And this is a logical progression of something the ACC has been doing for the past 50 years. We were founded in 1972 with the idea that older adults really need to not just get in shape, but really um, you know, plan their lives around consciously developing great habits for, for living and staying healthy so you can be independent and uh, self-sufficient. So that's what we've been doing for the last 50 years. Uh, we own a nursing home, two assisted care facilities, a memory care, and this building here is where all of our lifelong learning and wellness takes place. So we have decided to invest in the development of this project. Uh, this is the current building that we're in. We are right there. And if you look outdoors, it's just nothing but a vacant field and a patio. We're going to move our existing pickleball court here over to the left. We're going to build a large shaded pavilion out into the field, and we're also going to develop a, a large, um, we're calling it Tai Chi Grove, but it's multi-use for all sorts of outdoor activities, not just physical activities, but meeting spaces for anything from classes to group therapies to just a place for people to gather for social purposes. Uh, this building here is almost the same size as the existing building, and this will house uh, more classrooms, a common area for gatherings, and a professional studio such as, well, this isn't really a professional studio, but we're calling it the black box. It'll seat about 250 people. We will have uh, live programs that are live streamed for online and also people coming in to watch, just like you are today. Uh, this project has been fortunate to have taken in a $1 million pledge towards the construction and endowment of ACC Wellness Park. All told, it will be about a $20 million construction and endowment project. And it's, um, this is sort of another view of it. But we want to just encourage your input and community support. Uh, connect us with people who have ideas for its use, as well as those who can you know, make a major gift to a facility and a program, if you will, that will last for many generations to come. So ACC just finished celebrating its 50th anniversary. And you know, people ask us, well, what's next in your, in your future? And it's really health and wellness. And we're putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak. So thank you for that. Um, this is, these drawings have only been out for less than a week, so you have an exclusive peek at <laughs> ACC Wellness Park. Again, I want to thank uh, Mary Ellen and thank Jennifer you. for today's program. And please follow us and sign up for our many, many things that we do here, not just what Mary Ellen produces, but all types of um, classes ranging from fitness to uh, support groups to classes and workshops that are geared towards health and wellness, finances, everything and anything older adults need to navigate their particular stage of, of aging. So thank you again, and thank you, Sean, for a great job uh, great. producing this, and to all of you for being here. And if I can just uh, close up by saying I have signed up for uh, Bingo, and also for How to Play Mahjong. My brother oh, just yeah. finally, uh, my father collected Mahjong sets. My mother got rid of them, and I just got one, so I'm going to learn how to play it. And please come to other events. If you have an idea of something that you'd like to uh, do, they're going to be expanded programming. Also, I'd like to uh, uh, invite those people that are especially on air from the Renaissance Society. Danny Lee is going to be speaking March 10th, I think, from 2 to 3 o'clock on the campus in the transitions class that Ken Cross is teaching. So she's going to be talking about ACC. And those people at Renaissance can actually meet her and find out more about the programming. Mm -hmm. uh, and now we're going to uh, end again. Thank you all for coming. There's still some coffee, tea, and some um, not wonderful pastries in the back. 
And Jennifer is going to stick around a little. Her books are for sale. I'm assuming that they are in all fine bookstores everywhere. All fine plus, bookstores everywhere. Plus Including that, a really posh one in London we just heard about. I'm so yeah, excited. Just, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And we'll see you next month.